honored to introduce Marius. So Marius Swart, he's kind of an analytical mind for hire, but in the sales and marketing world, uh, it's a really interesting blend of people skills, uh, data management, systems, technology. I've seen him in action on all sorts of different levels, uh, small companies, large companies, technology, services, construction, uh, you name it. Um, so with that being said, know that uh, Marius is a native South African. You'll realize that very quickly here in a moment. And he loves big cats and fast cars. <laughs> good morning, Evan, thank you. Um, and good morning, everyone else. Yeah, so to prove that I'm from Africa, I'm gonna break down in the tribal dance. I'm not gonna do any of that. I, I suspect he's referring to my accent, which I like to think of as Northern Jersey, but. Um, all right, so is anybody in the room not interested in how to grow sales? Because there's a lovely bar in a restaurant about two you know, buildings across. And so we are to talk about sales and the first quote you know, is, is something that any CEO in 2015 should say, that if our salespeople are on target, our business does well. Just out of curiosity, that's not, that's not always the case in businesses. Is there any business here where that is not true? All right, so now the second point. Is there any business where the following, where, where you actually have all your salespeople 100% on target? And it's not a, a joke question, it's a serious question. Does anybody actually have the salespeople 100% on target in this room? So think about that for a moment. We all know that if our salespeople are 100% on target, that our business performs well. And so the next question is, do we know exactly what to do to get our salespeople 100% on target? And that's what this talk is about. It's, it's about thoughts and processes to kind of, you know, jog your memory a little bit on things that you already know and just bring it to the forefront and, and first of all, to get to a strategy. Um, even though sales is one of the most important departments in the company, it's also often the most unstructured department in the company. And it's very rare that you find growing businesses like yourself where they put a check mark next to each of these five points on there. And I apologize that it's pretty small, so I'll read them for you. Total potential market visibility. Do you know the, the, the buyers for your product set or services set? Do you know every single one of them, name, title, email address, telephone number? Do you have visibility of every potential buyer for your product or service? Is it possible? Do you think it's possible to know that? Anybody? Yes. yes. Dashboard driven activity goals and measurements. Do you know exactly how many calls it takes to get to a meeting, to get to a proposal, to get to a deal? If you know that, can you real time look at your sales team and say, okay, this is how we're heading towards having so many calls, so many proposals, so many meetings, and so many deals. So that's one, that's one of these questions as well. Does that exist in your business? Sales playbook. When a new salesperson walks into your business, can you hand them a playbook and say to them, this is exactly how you get to your sales goals from start to end. This is week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, and so on. Can you hand them a sales book and can, do you have a sales book for your experience reps? Do your experience reps have a guideline or a playbook that they follow? For example, when they get to a certain circumstance in the sales process and there's a challenge, can they go somewhere and say, how, how do I get over this point? That's called a sales playbook. Two years of documented strategy and adjustments. Sales is one of these funny areas in a, in a company where everybody is an expert. All we need to do is this. If we do this, we'll solve everything. I think all of us have heard this kind of comment many times, right? But all we need to do is this one thing and we'll solve all our sales problems. Um, <clears throat> yet it's very hard to find companies <coughs> that have executed several sales strategies and eliminated the bad ones. There's always, they always get resurrected. So think in your own business. So year one, you do this and then 
eight months into it, you bring back an idea you had two years ago, and you try that one again. And it's, it's so unstructured, it's, it's uncanny. It's almost funny, if you think about it, if it wasn't as, you know, um, impactful on the outcome, that there aren't a lot of strategies that gets tried and gets uh, revised on a consistent basis. You should have 10 examples of things that you've tried and the result of the outcomes in a sales team. So for example, you would say in 2015, our sales strategy is X. We can have so many salespeople, we want so many proposals out there, we want so many deals, and we're gonna go after these markets. And then there's a couple more strategy things you'll, you know, we'll talk about today that you should have in there. And you set that strategy, and you're unequivocally and unwavering, you, you don't waver from it, and you follow that strategy for three months, for one quarter. And after the quarter, you take that strategy and you analyze how you did. You look at all the little components, some of them we'll talk about today, that you add in there, and you revise them if you have to, or you stick to them if they work. And now if you didn't reach your quarterly goals, then something is wrong. Either your goals are too high or unrealistic, or some element of what you did is not working out. That kind of makes sense, right? And then you make adjustments, and then you follow those adjustments for quarter two, and you do the same thing. You look at that three month span. How did we do? Did we improve our performance? And then you make a few more adjustments. And if you do that for two years, you can have 10 data points. You can have the strategy you thought of to start with for the year. And then you've got the four adjustments to that strategy. And the next year, you're going to start with all that beautiful insight. And now you're going to do the same thing. And the rule of thumb is if you have two years of doing that, now you're in a position to have a proper strategy. Kind of fascinating, right? I mean, it's not hard, but it's actually very difficult to find companies that are that specifically focused on this strategy. Does that kind of resonate with anybody? That sort of, you know, set a strategy, then revise four times a year. Does that resonate? Does anybody actually, does anybody have some experience like that in sales already in the room? Do you think other departments have strategies that they go down and then they make adjustments and they improve their strategies? Do you think other departments do that? I really hope so, otherwise I would be scared of using any product that is invisible range here. Because of course they do it, because it doesn't work, consumers don't like it, people don't like it, it's not working as well as we thought, and they make adjustments. But it's funny enough that sales, which is one of the most impactful parts of a business, that it's unstructured and that process is not there. <clears throat> So the, the, the last point is product services roadmap. It's where you actually, um, is there anybody in the room that's, so how many people are business to business in the room? Show of hands. And any business to consumer folks? Okay, thank you. And so for, for, for both of those areas, clearly business to consumer, we get it, right? You want there's masses of buyers out there and you want feedback as soon as possible, you know, product improvements and things like that. But in business to business, it's almost as important to understand the interpretation of your products or services and getting feedback from your salespeople. I mean, because they sell what we make or what we service, right? And so there's a good set of ears out there in the field of something that could change a little bit. Unless you have this formal feedback structure on your product roadmap, you've got You've all saw these drawings about people designing what to the swing in a tree, and you know you tell the engineer you want the swing, and then this convoluted thing comes out at the other end. You all see these little drawings. You know what I'm talking about? Am I just crazy? Or <laughs> there must be only in South Africa people swings or something. So, and that's kind of what happens in business. It's really, I mean, how many times do sales actually talk to engineering or to product people about the product? So putting formal structures in place to make those things happen helps with this over here. So is there anybody that honestly feels that they've got those five things taken care of in their business? It's possible. I'm just curious. Evan, how about you guys? Let <laughs> me put you on the spot over here. <laughs> We've got a few of these. Um, the sales playbook is something that uh, could be developed or at least <coughs> You know, could be originated at this point. Uh, two years of documented strategy. We're just having been around for two years, so uh, that process could get started. So yeah, we've got opportunities here for sure. 
So, so the, the quarterly reviews are kind of fun because the, um, you know, as salespeople, we kind of, you know, we kind of don't like to admit that we didn't do as well as we thought we would at the beginning of the right pool. We think big, and we're going to make it happen. It's a very highly motivational environment and so on and so on. And then the quarterly reviews are very sobering, right? It's like, hang on a minute. We really did think this when we started the quarter, and this is really where we now are. So, yeah, something didn't happen. And then you look at the reasons why the quarter didn't happen. What happens if all four quarters are on target? You reach your target. So very few companies actually have 100% of their reps on target, 100%. Then there is a value to discuss what went wrong. So, so this one over here, the, I would say number four over here, two years of documented strategy. That's something you don't need a consultant to help you do. You just need to do it. So right, so that's a pretty easy one to start doing. It's like, hang on a minute, what is our strategy for sales? How many, uh, how do we work the funnel from the top to the closed deal? And anybody can, you know, any sales leader, any salesperson can sit in, any CEO, in the room can sit and take a piece of paper and just kind of take five minutes to write it down and in your own mind remind yourself what your strategy is. Um, and all of those elements that we just spoke about talks about sales readiness. How ready are you to really achieve sales? And that's part of, you know, um, some of what we're talking about here is when you, when you leave the room, clearly I'm not a motivational speaker. I, I don't have the sassy one-liners. I don't have the, you know, the uh, movie star looks and all these type of things. So I'm, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a, I'm a person that's going to leave you here with a couple of tools. I've heard more motivational speakers in my life, and if I never have to listen to one again, I'll be really happy because it all ends up the same. You run out of the room with your hair on fire, <laughs> and then when you get to someone, it's like, hey, so what was that third thing he said? Or, and, so this is not that thing. There's going to be a couple of bullet points that's going to stick in your head, hopefully, and you know, and, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish here. Um, so if you thought you're going to come here and you know, you're an entertaining, motivational speaker speech, this is like the wrong place. But we're going to talk about sales readiness, and you're going to think about that. It's like, what does sales readiness mean to me? And the first thing, the, 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 the foremost thing is that there should be no excuses to do this. You should have no excuses to be sales ready. You may not execute it perfectly, but you can start executing in a manner that you can adjust and get better every quarter. This slide is kind of, you know, uh, uh, interesting slide, I guess, because I always wonder if I should put it in. But, you know, I had a, a software business in the New York City area, and, and I was there when 9-11, not in New York City, I was actually in New Jersey, you know, at a conference, not dissimilar to this. And I had 400 employees in my company, so I had a bunch of people all over the country flying around. And I had people in New York City as well <clears throat> at the time. And I'll never forget, one of my employees <clears throat> went out to smoke. And he sat in the car with the door open, you know, and he, in his car with the door open, and he was listening to the radio while he was having the smoke. And he came back and he said, we have a problem. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to ban at the conference. He said, well, clearly it's a big problem. And that was when 9-11 when happened. And so it's like, you know, we, shut on the conference, I ran back to the office, tried to determine where everybody was, you know, around the country and so on and so on. So clearly, Neil, you know, it was such an impactful moment that we all understand it and probably know somebody that's involved in it. Talk about an excuse to not have good sales in, in 2001, right? That's a pretty good excuse. The company's located right there near New York City, the whole city's in shambles, everything's in shambles, it's a crazy time. We closed a $20 million deal that was signed on November 1st, 2001, less than two months after 9-11. $20 million deal for my company. And, the, and part of it was deliberate. It was to, to make the point that, you know, America, specifically, the business goes on, and it has to go on, and that's what makes this country what it is. And you can't take things that happen around you and use those as excuses for your strategy. You have to stay the course. And sometimes in, in moments of adversity comes also moments of opportunity because sometimes in the worst circumstances, your competitors are paralyzed. And you can get up and you can say, well, they're paralyzed, I'm wondering what the heck is gonna happen. I'm sticking, staying the course, I'm executing my strategy. And sometimes you're there alone because nobody else showed up. 
um, there are some repeated patterns. So, so when I, you know, kind of built this company and I got and I and I was done with it and I and I got out of it because I'm, I get bored pretty easily, um, which is not a good thing. But you know, the the venture capital and private equity community said, well, hey, you know, come look at our portfolio companies and see if you can help us do what you did with your business. And so the beauty of that was that. Um, I got to see a lot of repeated patterns through the eyes of these private equity and venture capital companies. They have like 30 or 40 companies that deal with it at the same time. They invested, you know, funds of, you know, sometimes like multi-billion dollar funds invested in 30 to 40 companies. They've got a bunch of analysts that are looking at, you know, patterns and things like that. And it was fascinating for me to see the things that repeat all the time that lead companies growing businesses into trouble. It was just fascinating to kind of have, wow, it, it was the same over there, and it's the same over there. And, and businesses are so unique that I, I really didn't think that was possible, because the products, different circumstances, different ways they got to where they are, how could there possibly be, be patterns that repeat? And there, there were. So I'm sharing a few of these with you, um, you know, and, and I can read guilty faces, by the way. So if any of these applies, I'll be able to quickly point out the ones that applies to. Um, so the first pattern that leads to disaster, and I put trouble in there because, you know, I was in a good mood, but it's actually disastrous when some of these things are true. When the foot soldiers are, are also the generals. So what do you do? Well, our great salespeople, that's our strategy. Just get the very best we can get. Okay, and then what? Well, they need to go and sell. So, okay, so this is like fighting an army where you get a soldier and you say, you know what, there are some great weapons. Off you go. It's like, well, where do I go to? Well, just go and shoot people. You know, this is how the gun works. I'm going to show you how the gun works. And you know, how this other thing works and the hand grenade works and stuff like that. So, go and kill people. It's like, well, uh, I don't know who to kill. Oh, I don't know which side I need to run to. When I get to the mountain, I don't know if I have to, you know, go up the mountain in the dark at dusk in the morning. I don't know where the enemies normally are located and stuff like that, right? So, but in most companies, and with a show of hands, who feels they're a little bit guilty of this, where the reps are hired and it's like, well, they're on their own, they need to just go and sell. That's why we hired them. Show of hands. Thank you for being honest, at least. The rest of you, you should feel guilty. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, it's so easy for that to happen, right? Because in other departments, if you hire a, a clerical person, you expect them that they would do the clerical work. You know, you forget that they also have a little training manual, they have a little bit on the job training as it goes along with sales. Those department, uh, sales department needs the same type of handling. Another repeated pattern is whether a CEO either owns sales, that means that 60% plus of the business still comes from the CEO, founder, guru, motivational, spiritual leader type of thing, that there's one person, and it's not always a CEO, but still that owns most of the sales. Sometimes the product guru or the service guru and something like that. True, is that true in any of the companies over here? Who feels that, right? And in other companies, the CEO actually looks at the sales team as the red-head stepchild and to be avoided at all costs. I don't talk to those people, they just need to do the job. So you've, So when you have either of those situations, that's going to lead to trouble. Something else that leads companies to trouble is when sales teams are supposed to find their own leads. This is actually one of the most common patterns out there. Show of hands, who in your company, or who, which company here wants their salespeople to find their own leads? This is the one where most the most of the hands go up, right? That pattern is called sales 1.0. That worked really well at some point. This is 2015, there's a lot of information and systems around. If you still have your salespeople find their own leads, you're heading towards trouble. 80% um, of sales are from 20% of a sales team, which means you've got a couple of superstars, but the rest are kind of not as superstar -y. Is that, some, some of you may have that. And then we have great relationships with our prospects, where you, you, you believe you still believe that sales are about relationships, and it so is not. It's not about relationships at all. Relationships play a role, but if sales is about relationships, even consumer business, by the way, if you think your sales is about relationships, 
wait a couple of slides and we'll have a good chat about it. Another repeated pattern is there's no lead generation outside the cell state. This, is, this kind, kind of goes hand in hand with the one that the, the sales people have to find their own leads, but it goes a little bit further because you may have you know, a methodology or some way to parade prospects in front of a sales team, but lead generation is an active, continuous process of finding leads. And if, it, and, and if you don't have people allocated to do that in your business, you're heading towards trouble. Now, if you're just starting and you're starting to grow and so on, these are good practices to start thinking about. You may not be able to execute them right now, but before you hire the next two or three or four salespeople, some of these elements are really good to start thinking about. No lead nurturing program. Sales, here's the magic about sales. If you know what you're making or, or servicing, and you know who can buy it, all you need to do is parade yourself in front of those entities until they get to the circumstances that want them to make them buy, right? If I drive around the road and there's a big old sign that says, spare tire, it's like, okay, so what? But if I'm on that same road and I'm in a hurry to get somewhere and I know there's nothing around me, and I just had a flat, I think I'm in a position to be a decent customer to buy a spare tire. Right? It's a ridiculous example, I know, I'm sorry. But you get the point, that there are circumstances that makes everybody a customer for you. And if you could be in front of them and say, are you one now, are you one now, yeah, no, no. And if you do that all the time to your total potential market, that's how you get sales. You just need to find the circumstance and we're going to talk in a little bit about the circumstance coming to you. You don't even have to necessarily parade yourself in front. You can actually let the circumstance come to you. We're going to talk about that in a moment. SEO investment exceeds AdWords. Who thought that search engine optimization was the new silver bullet for sales? <coughs> Nobody. All right. Let, so how many of you guys at search engine optimization experts come and visit you and talk gobbledygook for a couple of hours that you had no idea what they were saying. Did that happen to anybody in this room? I think so, right? Because it's new and it's fancy and it's like maybe this is the silver bullet. And it's so not. I don't care what business you know, you're know you in, it just didn't deliver. There is something though that did deliver and that's Google. Google AdWords flat out works. It works in business to business, certainly works in business to consumer, and if you spend more money on search engine optimization than you do on Google AdWords, that's another little nugget of wisdom you can perhaps take away from this. And if you don't believe me, just go Google it. <laughs> um, so, and is there anybody in the room that actually don't use AdWords? It's 2015, we know stuff. There's a lot of information around us. We, you, you know, it's very easy to get your total potential market in one database and find ways to parade yourself in front of your total potential market all the time. That's possible to do today. It's very easy to know exactly where you should open your next office. It's very easy to know which is the next salesperson you need to hire. It's 2015, there's a lot of information out there. <clears throat> you actually have the ability to bring buyers to you if you are analytical enough about what makes people buy. You can bring buyers to you because there are ways to harvest the circumstance when people have this immediate need to buy your product or service. For example, so who would like me to use an example for the business of that? I don't know, just put up your hand. I don't know what business you're on. This is not a magic show. It may not work, but let me try it. So let me pick you. What business are you in? Commercial air conditioning. Okay, great, commercial air conditioning. So what is a circumstance that would make people buy your product? Summer. Summer, there you go. Well, that's pretty easy. All right, but so commercial is, this is, so it's for commercial buildings, right? Buildings, hospitals. Okay, so I guess when there's an announcement of a new building environment or a new building going up and so on, that's perhaps a buying or a selling opportunity for you, you know, you can go to engineer. Yeah, it's a little trickier. <clears throat> it's not just as easy as going to Google. They have a lot of buy boards and specialized 
places that they, post, that they post those type of projects on. Okay. And so you probably get alerts mm -hmm. from them already and stuff like that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And so, so what the internet allows us to do is look for for things like these bulletin boards. So you can put the, you can put a spider on a bulletin board today that could look for events like new contract awarded for building a building, you know, something relevant to your business. You can say when somebody gets promoted, um, you know, you want to know about it because then they're going to be in line for some product. Uh, when um, somebody buys a car, you know, when there's a car sale there, and when there's, there's a lot of available data today that if you think of circumstances in your business that could lead to a buying, you know, to a buying event, you could bring that data to you. And you can start off the morning for your sales team to say, here are 10 opportunities which you should pursue because there's a chance that a few of them are perfect buying opportunities. And, you, and, and so what high performing companies do, they actually spend time on writing components that bring that data to them in their CRM. So when the rep walks into the, into, into, you know, you distribute obviously across your team, but they will, when they walk in there, they have potential buying opportunities, <coughs> circumstances that they buying opportunities right in their face that they could do. There's a website, it's free, you can mess around with it. It's called IFTTT. IFTTT, yeah. If this, then that. IFTTT, so go Google it. And, you know, and I will say that a lot, because Google is by far, your smarter sales assistant ever. You need to be able to read and re jump from reality, but I mean, there's enough of, of good stuff around that you can really learn a lot. So IFTTT is called If This Then That. You can actually connect to RSS feeds from just about any website. You can put the crawler on Monster, for example. You know, one of the businesses we were in, the buying opportunity was when somebody tried to hire an HR manager. So if somebody tries to hire an HR manager, that's a perfect opportunity for a PO, which is a staffing company, to go in and say, look, don't hire an HR manager, use our service. And so it's very, so if you write an RSS, you, you know, you take an RSS feed from all the areas where they would announce, you know, posting and so on, you actually make a go crawl monster and career builder and stuff like that. <laughs> you create, get an inbox out, well, all these people are looking for HR managers. Like, oh, wow, and it's free. So it's a kind of cool thing, you know, if the weather changes to 85 degrees, so you go to weather.com and you look for those alerts and you know, I think it's a silly example, but you know, something like that. So it's, it's all out there. Um, your employees can bring customers to you. Employees are a very big part of lead generation if you talk to the employees the right way. And if you don't have an employee related referral program, and if they don't know what's in it for them to bring a lead to you, then you're missing out on something you're already paying a lot of money for, which is your workforce. And there are great tools that actually keep track and make employees feel good about bringing leads to the company. There are great tools that incentivize them. It's not always money, it's some recognition, it helps with communication. You know, it's a great idea to stand up and say, hey, we've got this new program. And the new program is, every time you bring us a lead, you're gonna get five points. And the first one to get 100 points, you get a gold star. I mean, seriously. And you print the gold star on a certificate with a name on it, put a nice little frame, and at the next company meeting you say, we have five gold star winners this week, or this month, or this quarter, or whatever. I mean, that's not hard to do. It might take of a difference. People love recognition, it's the gamification thing, you can make it competitive and playful. Your, if your employees are not, empowered to bring you leads, you're losing out on something you're already paying a lot of money for. It's a very easy one to do. Big data. Who, I mean, everybody's heard about big data, right? What does it mean? Who feels that they can describe the meaning of big data really well? And it, it really means a lot of different things, and so nobody's going to be wrong. Does anybody want to have a shot of how do they think about big data? What do you think about big data? Vast amounts of information that leads to what? <laughs> that, that what? What's the value of it? Well, I think the value is based on what you do with it. I mean, we use uh, an enormous amount of data internally with our business development group and trying to.
captured lists uh, of prospects or opportunities, uh, but it's only how you, how you use the data and determine it. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's a good answer. Is you look at uh, everything that's available to you and you can interpret it in some way, shape, or form. And big data is fascinating because really what the world is saying, it's saying what we just spoke about, is that we know stuff. If you, if you want to know stuff, it's available for you to know. You just need to scratch around and understand what it is that you want to know. Um, as, as we're speaking today, there's data being transmitted by all of us that serves cell phone companies. So if you have a cell phone like this gentleman, whatever you did there, AT&T or whoever you with knows you did that, by the way. It knows where you are. It knows how much you're spending on your phone bill. So it kind of has a profile of you as a consumer. It knows that you've been in this room for X minutes and it knows where you're going afterwards. I mean, it's simple. They know exactly how you move and they know more or less how you were presented as a consumer in terms of how much money you spent. I mean, it's kind of scary and interesting and weird at the same time. Um, I'm involved with a company that's parsing all the cell phone tower data and pushing it as fast as they can to a processing center where they actually interpret what the data means. For example, where should you open a gas station or where should you open a convenience store or where should you open this? Where do people move and what are the demographics? Are you going to open a high-end store? Because the people that move to this area makes a lot more money than the people that constantly move to that area. And, and you have profiles of things. I mean, that's being done today as we speak. And you know, it's, it, there's a privacy discomfort with it. There's all kinds of discomfort about it. But here is the reality. Big data is very much alive and happening as we speak. And if you don't think that you just help somebody influence a buying pattern by switching on your cell phone, then, you know, then you're not paranoid enough. <laughs> <laughs> because you just did. And we all kind of, and it's fascinating that they actually, you know, that some of the stuff is legal, but it is. And nobody, you know, it's kind of interesting how they do it. So the big cell phone companies actually try and keep it, you know, all this awareness. They try and keep it under the radar a little bit. And then, of course, Facebook, what's this thing that they thought would happen with Facebook that they can actually see you as you walk around on your camera and stuff like that. Oh, Please, that's not true. Anyway, that's, just, that's not true. I mean, yeah. If, if you put your camera on, on your cell phone, you walk around like this, sure, people can pick that up. But unless you do that, you're pretty safe. It's in your pocket and you haven't switched on it. It's just silliness. But, but it's out there and it's real. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about sales automation. And again, this, this is in the same pattern as set your strategy, follow your strategy, know how you're doing towards your strategy, and then make adjustments. This is also a good, it's the simplest thing on the planet. It's nothing that we wouldn't do in any other department, but this does not happen in sales. I mean, it's the funniest thing. Just look how simple that is. Plan your week, execute your plan, and then adjust your planning on results. Who, who is actually directing sales in this room? Who's a salesperson? Lexa. All right. And clearly you're a smart salesperson because you're coming to find out how to do things, you know, perhaps different to your, you know, just learn a few, a few things. So great. So how effectively do you plan your day? How much time do you spend planning your day? And I'm not talking looking at your calendar and figuring out where you're going to drive to. How effective do you actually plan your day? What, is my, what are my biggest opportunities that I need to close today? How many of my early stage will I move to the later stage? You know, how does this fit into my overall strategy? It's a very, it's, it's, it's a tool-based challenge. You need to have good tools to plan your day, but it's just fascinating to me that, that it's hard to get salespeople to plan their day. It's very reactive. Sales is extremely transactional. There's a lot of moving parts. You know, it's actually a very cognitively challenging environment. And in fact, we can talk about what is a good salesperson here in a moment, and some of it will be, you know, you'll know this because you are in sales, but, but it's actually now being proven as well as what makes a good salesperson, and people will be surprised at that. So plan your week, and it means plan all your strategy components that you're trying to prove. So don't just say, well, I'm planning my week, and this is Sally here, and Peter, and Joe, and Sue, and I've got a networking meeting there, that's not planning. Planning is, 
I'm going to make 50 calls this week. I'm going to have eight meetings. It's going to produce two proposals. And if I do that every week, it's going to give me eight proposals a month, and I'm going to post 25% of it, which is like two, I guess. So that's, and then this is what I'm doing today to fit into that strategy. That's planning. Planning is not just reviewing your calendar or, you know, it's knowing what I'm doing, how it's impacting my strategy that I set up, and how it's actually going to go towards helping me understand if it's the right strategy. Does that make sense? I mean, so there's a little difference in just planning your time, per se, and planning your week based on the strategy. So the strategy is against it alongside it. And then execute your plan. <clears throat> you know, if you visiting Sally, because, you know, you haven't seen her for a while, but Sally is actually not a critical path to your strategy and to your goals and so on, just, you know, go see Sally at another time. Execute your plan. Don't execute the emails and the fires, right? And the things that are a million of them running at us, it's like, execute your plan. And then adjust your plan, because insanity is, you know, doing the same thing all over again. When it's wrong, that's insanity. We, or you could be an ostrich with your head in the sand and say, ah, just kind of, whatever comes in, I'm just going to keep on doing that, because, you know, hopefully we get lucky, and it's a numbers game, your dad was on the slide somewhere, so I'm just going to do a lot of stuff, and maybe stuff will happen. That's not really not how it works. There's too many moving parts in sales. Let's talk about sales superstars. We have all had this around us, where this one person is going to make everything better. Sales superstar. Comes from the competitor, lit the world on fire, built the business single-handedly. They're so sad that they lost their job. One, this person, she's going to turn our company around. This guy, people love him. He looks like Magnum PI, and you know, and he, whatever. He looks like a what's the dude, the rugby player we have that everybody loves? Oh, come on, rugby? Not rugby, football. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from South Africa. I'm sorry. Tom <laughs> Brady. <laughs> no, no. J J. JJ, thank you. There you, you see, that wasn't hard. J J. Watt, right? This guy is like the J.J. White of sales. <laughs> is they gonna do everything for us? Um, so we all heard about sales superstars, and they're kinda cool if you can have them. I've got bad news for you. The really good ones are working for Apple, and Google, and IBM, and Oracle, and Microsoft, and you know, General Electric, and stuff like that, sorry. You have slim pickings to find a sales superstar. The good ones are already CEOs. <coughs> They're already running businesses. They run businesses like you guys do, right? It's hard to find. Now, if you're a salesperson, I'm not saying you cannot be a superstar, or you may be a superstar already, but you're kind of under the radar because you're not at Google and Microsoft and Apple and so on because they pay the biggest bucks and they will get the best superstars. So thinking you're going to build your business with sales superstars, it's perhaps not the greatest strategy on the planet. The words from the, the repeated patterns say, Build your business with B players. If you're growing, if you earn hundred twenty dollars in revenue, and your strategy is to find A players for sales, good luck. They're hard to find. That they certainly are to keep. And you're much better off building a strategy where you think I'm I'm building my team with good B players. Now the CEOs and the sales leaders are often A players themselves. But if you're building team members, it's a good thing to think about B players. So what does a good salesperson look like? Why would I say selling is not about relationships? Why would, why would words like that even come out of somebody that feels that they're comfortable enough talking to a group of people about sales? How could I possibly get away saying that? How does Harvard, how, why did Harvard publish this article and why are there maybe 20 scientists right now working on assessments that tries to analyze you know, the success of salespeople? And I'll talk about that in a moment. But, why would the help? Does anybody have any idea why that could be somewhat true? That's a very good answer. That's very true. If you, if you have a relationship and the person you had a relationship with leaves the company, now what? You're not going to sell anything to them anymore. That's a very good. That's a very good point. Why? why? Some other reasons why that isn't 
true. Well, first of all, you can be the best friends with a guy because you don't know what they're actually talking about, and if there's a buying opportunity and you just missed it, the relationship isn't going to help you much because you didn't hear the buying opportunity, right? So, um, now, if you have a nice person here and a not so nice person there, and they have the same ability to sell, yes, the nicer person will probably get more deals because we all want to deal with nicer people. So I'm not saying that it doesn't play a role, but if it's only about the nice and only about relationships, then it's a bad strategy. And in fact, a lot of companies, you know, kind of almost take that relationship out of it. I'll give you an example. I was with an assessment <laughs> company. We sold a $30 million deal to Accenture. Uh, it was my, it was on my watch. It was a six-month sales cycle. It was very heavily com com contested by IBM, who owns a company called Connexa. This was with SHO, you know, um, assessment company. And they looked at everybody. They Accenture can buy anything they want on the planet. So they looked at everybody. Six-month evaluation. There were project meetings and so on and so on. I have not met a person on that project plan in six months, and we got the contract signed with DocuSign over the internet without me ever seeing their faces, hearing their voices a lot, reading the emails a lot, literally not having shake, I did not shake hands with somebody that placed the $30 million deal with the company. And we saw them at the, um, we have a SHL at the annual customer event. That's the first time I saw them and they didn't look anything at all like their voices, which is disappointing <laughs> in some cases and very undisappointing in other cases. But you know, just weird, right? Six months of it, it feels like you know them. You haven't seen their faces. So, you know, and do you have some sort of relationship over the telephone? I guess, you know? Um, but it's about, it's about your understanding of their needs them understanding what you provide and being good with making that a trusting sort of a trusting transaction of knowledge transfer. Now, people are still, people still buy from people, so this sounds like it's conflicting, it's really not. People buy from people, but they don't necessarily buy from people because they have a relationship with it. They buy from people because they're smart enough to understand what they're saying. If you Google that that article, by the way, if you don't know, who knows about this article? Just ask your smart sales assistant to find that article for you, which is Google, and go read a little bit about it. It's fascinating, because what they say is that by making that statement, you know, we know we're gonna ruffle the relationship feathers a little bit, because every self-respecting salesperson, sales leader is gonna think, of course it's about relationships. And so they did that deliberately to prove that, hang on, I'm gonna upset you, but I'm still gonna get you to read my article. So it was kind of cool. You know, it was a very intelligent you know, little article. But what they said is that, what's it about? So is anybody hiring, in the process of hiring any employees right now? Do, you, do who of you use assessments to select the employees? So assessments have been around for 85 years. It, it deals with humans as workers. We are allowed to record humans as workers, their results, right? So you as humans as humans, that's clinical psychology, you know, you get into the head of a human as a human, you can't really go write it, uh, you know, publish it on your blog. Well, Sally, that's a crazy one. She said this, that, this, the next one. You can't really go do that because it's a client patient privilege thing. So we don't we can't as casually read about humans as humans, but humans as workers, now that's fair game. We know a lot. We don't necessarily write on the names, but we know patterns of behavior on our inference. So assessments, what they do, they help predict the better performance, performers. And with salespeople, a lot of us always thought that the heart was the most important part. And then what, what is coming to fruition right now is that good salespeople actually extremely smart. Their brains are wired beautifully. The very effective salespeople are actually probably some of the most, the smartest people cognitively in your company. And that's been, that's been the study. So what, what this study also says, and they now actually work with Corporate Executive Board, which is one of the foremost advising companies on the planet. And what they are saying is that actually you have to focus more on the head than on the heart 
when it comes to salespeople. So, you know, just for giggles, um, humans as workers, there's five things we know about them. We know, you know, the head, the heart, the hand, can do what you does, a cognitive behavioral situational judgment. How smart are you? Are you motivate, motivated you are in terms of doing, applying your smarts? And then the reality, how, how smart are you when the chips are down, when you really do things? So that's called, that's the baseline of psychometric measurement. And then you've got motivation, emotional intelligence as two extra layers. So we know a lot about humans as workers. And the, the hard stuff, you know, is personality tests. So does anybody know Myers-Briggs? The test disc and, and all that? That's called a personality test. Also lovingly referred to as a horoscope. <laughs> you know what a horoscope is, right? Is that the right word? That's when you're, you're born on this date and then but if you by accident read the wrong one, it's like still not that bad. Uh, they just sound like me. <laughs> and if you, you know, yeah, that's horoscope. It's like, depending what mood you're in, it's like this one, oh, wow, look at this, honey, take this one out. This is, I'm gonna have a great day. <laughs> and so that's what these Myers Briggs things are. We could call them that, but what it does, it's a test. And any test is better than none, because as humans, we are not, we are poor judges of character although we are genetically programmed to be good judges of character because we have to procreate. So, well, genetically. I'm, did I just break a million HR rules there? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, let me rephrase that a little bit. I'm not gonna rephrase that. That's not All right, but, so the psychologist tells us that, that okay, we, we are, you know, predestined to think we are good judges of character, but we truly are terrible at it. And I said, well, how can you say that? I always thought I'm a good judge of character. The guy says, well, look at the divorce rate. So if we were that great, you know, and putting all the time and effort and, you know, wanting and dining and all the other stuff that goes around in it, how did we do picking our life partner? And the point was made, and I had to, to acknowledge that. And so how do we, how do we, so when we select salespeople who are bigger than life, you know, often forceful and so on, you know, what, how do we pick them? And uh, the smart money says, look at the cognitive side before you look at anything else. So if you have 10 candidates, find out who's the smartest, who has the best reasoning, comprehension, you know, deductive reasoning, you know, is a good measurement. Deductive reasoning is actually the one that I would use for salespeople more than others. So if you have psychometric assessments, and it has to be cognitive, it cannot be, describe a situation where, right? It can't be behavioral. It, it has to be math, and you know the, the person has to. It's like a little IQ test, but we don't call them that because. But it's a it's a cognitive assessment. So the one other fact that you could take away if you use assessments, use one that has a cognitive assessment component in it for salespeople. There's a sport that uses cognitive assessments. It's NFL. The quarterbacks are actually cognitively assessed. It's called wondering. Wonder and then LIC. So it's Wonderlic is the name of the assessment. It's been around for, for a long, long time. So go Google it, ask your smart sales assistant, and it will tell you that the NFL has been using that for years and actually leaks the best quarterbacks. Because you need to be pretty smart when you're a quarterback. I mean, talk about thinking fast. Now, clearly, if you're a coach, you don't need to be all that smart because you just don't, you know, you throw the ball instead of passing it. But <laughs> head, heart, hand. Um, and if you go with those three areas of assessments, focus on the head more than anything else. Even it looks like Microsoft has taken over your computer. And Can you go forward? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know, I guess, yeah. All right, <clears throat> any questions about that part over here? Any challenges, anything you wanna say about that? This is normally a pretty emotional reality is that soul superstars are not about relationships, all right. Unique value proposition. Um, most of our companies have mission statements and value statements, right? So we start mission, vision, objective, and then you have some value statement that you put as well. And a lot of people can recite those. It's, you know, you sometimes get a consultant in and you pay them $20,000 and they come up with a beautiful acronym and they print it on a little card and it says like integrity and this and that and the next thing and we all have that, right? And some of us can actually, who can actually remember them just for giggles? Did anybody come up with your own value statements or did somebody here use consultants to do it? Yeah. 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 Ye
Who we use consult to show events? All right. Thanks for being honest. Everybody else is like, hang on, I'm serving big data here with telling them stuff. <laughs> um, however, so now you can list your value statements. How many of you can, can recite your unique value proposition? What is our unique value proposition? It's not the mission, it's not the vision, it's not the objective. It's the elevator pitch of what we do better than any reasonable competitor alongside us. Now, sometimes when I work with small business owners, it's like, well, clearly, we're going to be the best thing in the world in this area over here. In fact, it's fascinating. If, if you look at websites of small of growing businesses, you'll see the words leading provider, the best, fastest growing. You see those self accolades flowing graciously on the websites of growing businesses. And some of it is actually more or less true, but a lot of it is just what we wish to be. Well, when it comes to unique value proposition, your value proposition can't it can't be what you wish to be. It has to be what you are right now. Because if you miss your value proposition, you're going to miss your total potential market. Your total potential market says, these are the names, email addresses, telephone numbers, addresses, companies, of the people that will buy my product or service. To that level of detail. Not the titles. These are the actual individuals who can buy my product. And if you, put, if you know your unique value proposition, you've got a very good opportunity to get to your total potential market. And that is possible in this day and age to get. You can get to your total potential market. Does anybody know how you would get to your total potential market? What, how would you get there? I know somebody that would know. Mike Beach would know, right? You get a list, and you download the list, and you throw it into your database. And if you don't, if you don't like that list, you, you, you go find another list. It's 2015, right? We know stuff. So we know the names and titles that is out there. You can get it for any industry. We, I mean, how much did you pay for that one? 100 bucks. And how many, how many people were in there? 1,000. Yeah. Pretty unique industry also, by the way. So if you scratch around a little bit, you can get the data. And what's kind of cool, if you know your value, unique value proposition, now you've got something to say to them. It's like, I know you are the guys that potentially buy. This is why we are great. This is, these are circumstances that make you buy from us, and we're going to tell you about these circumstances a lot. And so, so that's that. Um, Morris, you have 10 minutes till we close. Can you use that how we like to do list Q&A? I'm, 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 I'm going to do Q&A. I was going to show you guys a little bit of the systems, but I'm going to skip that because, you know, because I'd rather spend the time on Q&A. The, the, um, to get to some of these things that we just spoke about, it does involve a process. It's not just making a decision to get there. The, you kind of have to crawl, and then you walk, and then you run, and then you fly. So there is sort of a natural progression of these things. The first and foremost one, one that all of you are capable of doing without any help, is the sales strategy. What is it that we need to execute to grow our sales? And if you look, get your unique value proposition accurately, if you get those two things online, you don't even need my help. Though, then you're off to a good start. Those two things are extremely important. You need to find a value proposition and your sales strategy, and then making adjustments 